In our last episode, we saved the mayor of Springfield and hopefully made the wasteland a little bit more ghoul friendly. Now we can move south to arrive at a brand new bunker, Bunker Gamma. Upon arrival, we can separate Dylan and his buggy from the rest of the crew so as not to get irradiated and head off to explore. Moving west, we reach a large room where we find a death claw running in circles. I have to hurry. I will be in heat soon, she says. Hmm, are you white meat or dark meat? Uh, it's hard to track her down to talk to her, but if we do... Your elders are wise, warrior. They accept my brood as recruits. My children wish to show their thanks. It is strange time, no? My young fighting with you and the rest of the soft, hairless ones. Treat them well, and don't feed them flesh after midnight. Farewell. It's the matriarch, I guess. I mean, we already have Mother in our party who has the exact same character portrait as the Matriarch. As we discussed at the time, however, Mother has a different character sprite than the Matriarch whom we released from Marden. However, this one does as well. The Matriarch in Marden was white and gray. This one is a sandy color. So I'm just all sorts of confused here. Who exactly is Mother? I don't know. Moving north, we find the Quartermaster. Welcome, soldier. I am Arugula. Say it with me. Arugula. Good. I'm the Quartermaster in charge of this bunker. You know how the drill works by now, so stop wasting my time. You need gear? Then cut the chatter and tell me what you need. Bartering with Arugula, we don't find anything new on his inventory, and it looks like Kerr the Merchant stayed at Bunker Beta. We don't find him here in Bunker Gamma. Moving back to the large room, we can head west. We find two rooms over here. Moving into the first one, we see a few familiar faces. Shari and her brother Tiduk. They are having a conversation. I still can't believe you made it through the tests, says Tiduk. And Shari stares hard at Tiduk. All right, Shari, maybe you're right, he says. And she continues to stare hard at Tiduk. Shari, you were right, okay, he says. I know, brother. I know, she says. My greetings, Hero of Brahminwood. I am Shari, captain of the new initiate class. Thank you for saving my home. My dream is to make you proud of the people that you've done so much for. I will try to follow your footsteps. Talking with her again. My greetings, hero. Guess what? I made it past initiate training. Not many of our tribe did, and I was at the top of the class. It is memories of you and your squad that gave me the strength to meet each challenge. Now they made me captain of the new initiate class. I'm even in charge of Tiduk. I must prepare for my group's first mission. Farewell, brother. Then talking with Tiduk. Well met, hero. My name is Initiate Tiduk of Brahmin Wood. I understand if you do not remember me, for I was one of many tribals. Your heroic actions that saved my village have inspired me and my sister, Shori. I hope the Brahmin God of Battle will allow us to fight side by side one day. We can barter with Tiduk, but not Shari, and he accepts ring pulls. He's got 2,000 bucks on his inventory, giving us a handy way to convert ring pulls into cash. Talking with him again. Well met, warrior. Well met. I am pleased to tell you that I have just achieved the initiate rank. I pray that the Brahmin god of epic battle will allow us to fight together. It would shake the wasteland forever. Unfortunately, my sister Shari also is here, and she is now in charge of the new initiates. And then a final time. I have to admit that I do not like taking orders from one better suited to raise children. Your brotherhood ways are strange. Very strange to Tiduk. Well, congratulations to Shari. Looks like Tiduk's got some adjustments to make. Moving out, we can go south to explore this next western room. 
Here we find the Recruits Master, but we don't see any new recruits available. So heading south, we can move into yet another western room where we find the Elders Council. Here we find a woman in civilian clothing named Hillary Eastwood. She says, my daughter is doing fine, thank you, but we can't have a conversation with her. Hillary, if you recall, was the mayor of the town of Quincy, whose daughter we saved from the Beast Lords. Nearby, we find the General, but it's not General Barnaby. It's General Decker. Come in, warrior. Please be seated. My name is General Decker, and I'll be briefing you for this specific mission. At 0900 yesterday, while on patrol, Fang Squad encountered a large contingent of heavily armed super mutants in the region known as St. Louis. They fought bravely against this overwhelming force and managed to radio in a distress call right before they were annihilated. Eight battle-hardened squads led by General Barnaby rushed to the scene and are now in pitched combat with the super mutants. While we were able to push them back initially, our losses have been staggering. As a result, we need to pull our forces out of there immediately. This battle is lost. General Barnaby has requested to have your squad rendezvous with his mobile command center and execute the evacuation of our wounded brothers. I've read your file, and I fully agree with General Barnaby's faith in you and your squad. From your lessons, you should recall that super mutants are genetically engineered soldiers that are strong, tough to kill, and can easily carry weapons that most people would mount on assault vehicles. They are to be handled with extreme caution. You are going into heavy combat unlike any you have experienced before. Remember to follow General Barnaby's direction. He'll get you out safe. Take an APC and facilitate the evacuation of any wounded squad members. You are to get in and get out. No heroics. I want this to be a by-the-book search and rescue operation. Trust in your weapons, warrior. And they will see you home safely. Dismissed. Oh no, General Barnaby's in trouble. Looks like we're heading to St. Louis, heading out and moving west. We find the Med Bay, and here we again find Celsius. He appears to follow us from bunker to bunker. He has a brand new item for sale called a paramedics bag. These are just like doctor's bags, but instead of increasing the doctor skill by 20%, they increase it by a whopping 40%. Pretty handy item. Back at the loading bay, we find a new mechanic here at Bunker Gamma. This is Murdoch. And while here, we should snag the Dean's Electronics and Zen and the Art of Piloting that he has on his inventory. We should have a few toolkits by now, but if we don't, we should buy at least two from this guy. We'll find out why soon. After selling all of our junk and healing on up, we can take both the Hummer and the buggy east towards the exit grid. We find St. Louis southwest of Bunker Gamma, close to Marden. As soon as we arrive... Ho ho! This one's a general by his markings. Keep this one alive and bring him to my inner sanctum. I'll wager there's a lot of information in that shriveled old gray head. Some hot poker stabbing his manhood will loosen up his tongue, I'll wager. It always does. Oh no, the mutants have captured General Barnaby. We've got to save him. Moving Dylan away from the party for now so he doesn't irradiate us, we can examine the ruined structure we find ourselves in. Against the northern wall is a workbench, and inside, a copy of Zen and the Art of Piloting, two big books of science, and two repair kits. These repair kits are gonna save our bacon in a bit, for in this structure we find a brand new vehicle, the APC, and we can hop inside. Next, we can take a look at our map. We arrive here in this southwestern green circle. This is our insertion point. We will begin our mission under the shelter of this ruined building. We need to pilot the APC into battle. Next to us is a red circle number four. Evacuate Talon Squad to this position. Move out of engagement range once both squads have reached the rendezvous point. Then due east of us, we find circle number one. Feng Squad was positioned here. We lost contact with them after they took a direct hit from an enemy rocket. Keep an eye out for survivors here. Then, north of circle number four, we learn that this is the front line for the super mutant army. The defenses are formidable. North of this is a large circle. 
The enemy has dug trenches around here, surrounding their operations center. Just north of this is a bridge. Brimstone Squad, headed by General Barnaki, was last heard from in this area. Investigate the area for the general and any survivors. We won't be able to get the APC in, so proceed on foot. North of this is the primary supermutant compound. This is the supermutant operations center. They have deep trenches that run around the perimeter of the base. We are not authorized to assault the enemy base. Ah, who needs authorization anyway? This is a rescue mission. We're gonna save Barnaki and get as much loot as possible in the process. East of here, we find another gray circle on top of more trenches. Demon Squad reported sightings of up to two separate squads of super mutants in this area. Expect an ambush. Then, north of here in a small circle, Talon Squad is being pinned by enemy fire believed to be originating at this point. Then to the east, we find red circle marked number three. Talon Squad is pinned down at this location. This is the final destination for our squad and the APC. Then southeast of here, according to Echo Boy surveillance reports, this rock slide looks engineered. We should keep our eyes open. What a landscape. What a battlefield. The super mutant compound is surrounded by a labyrinth of trenches, and we have to get through at least one of them to check up on General Barnaki. There are four bridges traversing a river that cuts through the map, but it looks like we have two paths to get to our primary destination. Up through the middle of the map to the northeast, or crossing the bridges to the east, traversing this wilderness, and then taking the bridges north. Well, I wanted to put this new APC to the test and see exactly how formidable the main super mutant forces were. I decided to drive north towards the first trench labyrinth. Even though Oxhorn is my highest piloting character, I still found this APC incredibly difficult to control. At one point, Oxhorn was just driving the APC in complete circles, even when I was giving directions to go somewhere else. To get out of this loop, I had to exit the APC and re-enter it. To the west of us is a wilderness and our ultimate exit grid. I wanted to explore it, but I couldn't get the APC there. So moving north, we arrive at the first bridge leading to the eastern section of the map. Instead of crossing it, we can move west to take out some super mutants. This APC is awesome, and we can keep going. Past these sandbag barricades, we find more super mutants attacking us from a series of barbed wire traps. directly in front of a bunch of signs warning us that mines have been laid out, and then we can send Mother out to loot. Now I've been reading viewer feedback, and some of you are saying that I don't really need to show off the inventory of every creature and enemy that we kill. Fair enough. Instead, I'll focus only on new and noteworthy things we find on these corpses, and we find something new almost immediately. This guy was carrying an M249 saw. The Belgian-made M249 saw, squad automatic weapon, was adopted widely in the late 20th century as a squad-level light machine gun, vastly increasing the firepower available to individual squads. It has a minimum strength requirement of six. It takes the 7.62 millimeter ammunition, one of the most common ammunitions in the game, the same used by the AK-47, and it weighs 20 pounds. 
This is our first big gun. Well, except for the missile launcher we got earlier, giving it to Stoma, my big guns character. It deals between 20 and 30 damage and has a range of 40 with an ammo capacity of 30. Holy cow. That's better than the H&K cause shotgun that he's currently equipped with. Compare it to the AK-47, which uses the same ammunition type and yet only does between 10 and 22 damage with a range of 28 and an ammo capacity of 24. They both have the same AP cost of 5. This is a huge and significant improvement for Stoma. Moving into the no man's land to loot, we pick up more of the M249 saws and we find some of the bodies of General Barnaki's Brimstone Squad many of whom are carrying stim packs. However, we get spotted by more super mutants and we can lure them back to the APC. Going back to no man's land, we loot more members of Brimstone Squad, but we don't find the body of General Barnaki. Of course, because we saw the super mutant boss drag him away. This barbed wire no man's land then bumps up against a labyrinth of trenches to the north. Remember, according to the map, these trenches lie directly in front of the super mutant stronghold that the Brotherhood wants us to ignore. So we've cleared this section of the map south of the trenches. I'm going to save the trenches and the operations center for later. First, we need to rescue Talon Squad. Heading back to the APC, we can move Harold out into the minefield. His trap skill is so good that he spots each and every trap, and we can loot them all. These traps sell for buku bucks back at the Quartermaster, and man, there are a lot of them. Harold finds traps along the clearing between No Man's Land and the river going all the way north until we reach the first northern bridge. I looted as many as I could, but I was starting to feel anxious getting this far away from the APC. So, with a bag full of mines, we can head back to the APC and take one of the bridges east towards the last known location of Fang Squad. I chose to take the southern of the two bridges first, and this puts us right up against a bunch of super mutants. pulls through. Almost each and every one of these super mutants is carrying an M249. So while we go from having practically no big guns available to us in the game to being inundated by them. After looting the dead we can hop back in the APC. We find a road leading east and then north. We can try to go off road but we don't get rewarded for doing so. There's really nothing out here. So back to the road and following it north we bump into super mutants, standing over the bodies of Fang Squad. Fang Squad didn't make it. Salvage any equipment. Recovering the bodies for burial will have to wait. Proceed to your next objective. Sadly, there were no survivors. But looting the dead, we find another brand new big gun, an M60. The 7.62 millimeter M60 saw widespread use with US and allied forces during the latter half of the 20th century as a light machine gun. It could also be mounted on vehicles. This one requires a minimum strength of seven and it weighs 23 pounds. However, it only does between 18 and 26 damage with a range of 35 though it does have an ammo capacity of 50. Compare this to the M249 saw we just got, which does between 20 and 30 damage with a range of 40 and an ammo capacity of 30. So the M60 requires higher strength to use, does less damage, has inferior range, consumes the same amount of AP, but has a higher ammo capacity compared to the M249. The ammo capacity just isn't a good trade-off for me compared to the M249's better range and damage. So we'll stick with the 249. The bodies of Fang Squad had a couple of these and we walk away with more stim packs and ammunition. Now, 
On either side of us, we find plateaus, accessible by ladders. During the fight, we did see shapes moving up there. Using Mother, we can first explore the plateau to the right, and sure enough, we find a super mutant hiding behind a rock. Ah! But thankfully, he blows himself up with a missile launcher. There's nothing else on this plateau, so heading back down. I used Mother to explore all the way around this. The eastern portion of the map is bordered by some sort of electrical grid and barbed wire blocking off a hillside. But then it wraps back around to the APC. So we can take Mother up the northern ladder to explore this plateau. Here we find another super mutant hiding with a rocket launcher. I got the jump on him. But man, despite having 12 strength, her unarmed attacks against this guy were pitiful and highly disappointing. We also got attacked by a guy from the ground. We can lure him south towards the APC. APC North, we see that the road ahead of us is mined. And there's a super mutant in a shelter with a long range weapon taking shots at us. He's really powerful and does enormous damage to the point that he can destroy our APC easily. You have allowed the mutants to overwhelm our armored transport. Evacuation is now impossible. You have failed. I tried a couple of times to kill this guy without putting the APC at risk. I sent some of my throwing characters to the top of the plateau, but he just does so much damage that he tears through us. So instead I used Harold's repair skill and a toolkit to fully repair the APC. When fully repaired, it has 350 HP. Using the APC as shelter, we can get in close, doing our best to avoid the landmines. I tripped one of the mines, but the APC still looks to be in working order. These guys were carrying some of those really powerful big weapons. Now here we find a bridge going north, but I wanted to explore back towards the west first. We see that this section is mostly cleared out. We do find a bunker in the middle of this wasteland and inside the bunker a chest. Oh, but it's booby trapped. Inside, however, we find a sniper rifle. Bringing Dylan up from the beginning of the map, we can have him loot the sniper rifle, and we see that it's a DKS-501 sniper rifle. Excellent long-range projectile weapon. Originally 308, this one is chambered in the more common 7.62 caliber. It has a minimum strength requirement of five, and it weighs 10 pounds. This is a wonderful weapon. It does between 14 and 36 damage with an ammo capacity of six and a range of 50. Compare that to the M1 Garand, which I had been using up until this point, which only did between 12 and 24 damage, with an ammo capacity of 8 and a range of only 40. This sniper rifle has the best range of any weapon we have yet to find in the game. It does more damage than the M1 Garand, it uses a much more common ammunition, so it's a no-brainer. Huge upgrade for our snipers. Back at the APC, we can send Harold out to see if the bridge is mined. And sure enough, we find mines on the road just outside the bridge. I then took Dylan out of the bunker where we found the sniper rifle to explore the northwestern bridge. And it's not mined. On the other side of it, however, is. But remember, we disabled those mines with Harold. Back to the APC, we can send Harold across the bridge to finish disarming the rest of the mines. Then we can use grenades to destroy these barricades. Sending Harold north up the road, we don't find any more mines. So, making sure the APC is fully repaired, we can take it across the bridge and follow the road to the north. Here we find more super mutants dug in like ticks. The 
mutants and their big guns are really whittling away at the APC's armor. I was grateful that, in addition to the two toolkits we found here, I brought two with me. At this point, I've already exhausted two of them. Our northern passage is blocked in with rubble. The path moves west. We pass by a sign that has the word MUTES painted in blood with a corpse lying on the ground. Driving on through, we find ourselves in an ambush with mutants shooting at us from the ledge to the south and more shooting at us from the ledge to the north. battle over, we can send Harold out to repair the APC again. That fight brought it all the way down to 24 hit points. Close call. On one of the bodies on top of the southern plateau, we find another sniper rifle. I went ahead and gave this to Babs. Then, moving south, we see that this section connects with the minefield just north of the first northwestern bridge. We can use Harold to do one final sweep to see if there are any mines. He does find one more. We can leave Dylan here for now until we need him. We can move Harold back into the APC, and then we can have Mother loot the bodies that we drove over to clear out this section. We find the remains of what must be part of Talon Squad. This is where they were ambushed. But we only find a few corpses here. Looks like others may have survived. If we loot all these bodies, we do walk away with a number of stim packs. We are now bumping up against the Eastern Trench Labyrinth. We are closing in on the last known location of the survivors of Talon Squad. Getting everybody in the APC, we can take it north. Here we find more mutants in a bunker. Then turning east, we find more Talon Squad bodies. Following the trail, we arrive at a blasted out Brotherhood Hummer, and at last we find the survivors of Talon Squad. It's about time some backup got here. Paladin Solo, commander of Talon Squad. It's not pretty here, brother. They're dropping bombs like it's the Great War. My troops are toast. I'm taking what's left of my unit and pulling out. Don't pull any punches with these muties. I watched one charge face first into some rough crossfire and laugh off the pain. Pull that APC up and tend to my soldiers. I can walk, but my squad needs medical attention. I'm not leaving until you get them on their feet. Hope you've still got a medic. And it's Paladin Solo, whom we met in one of the bunkers during an earlier mission. Before he and Talon Squad will join us, we have to heal them all. Thankfully, I had a stack of 17 or so stim packs, and we can use them to heal each member individually. There are four wounded members of Talon Squad in this bunker, and it takes around four stim packs to fully heal each one. So to complete this part of the mission, we almost exhaust our entire stim pack supply. Now, while browsing the game files for this mission, I discovered some additional dialogue that hints that at one time this mission was intended to play out very differently. For example, after healing the survivors of Talon Squad, I believe the developers originally intended for us to take control of all four members to briefly add them to our squad. For after healing them, this audio file was supposed to trigger. Paladin Solo and her troops are now ready to move out. Select each one and get them into a vehicle. Once within the armored confines of the APC, the troops will remain there until you complete the mission. However, we can't control the members of Talon Squad. So instead, after healing all four members, this triggers. Paladin Solo and her troops are now inside the APC. Drive them back to the evac point. And with that, they simply disappear. And presumably, they are now inside the APC. Now it's possible to fail the mission here if any of the members of Talon Squad die. There aren't any enemies over here, but presumably we could kite some of the mutants to this area to use Talon Squad's firepower to get rid of them. And if in so doing any of them die, Decker says this. You have allowed the fallen warriors to perish. Maybe General Barnaki's faith in you was misplaced. 
Try again, William. But we've got what we came for. We rescued Talon Squad. We could now move to the exit grid. But I really wanted to see what treasures awaited us on the other side of the super mutant trench labyrinth. I sent Oxhorn to loot most of the bodies and we come back with rich rewards. I moved him closer to the labyrinth to see if we could find a way down into it. On the way, we find a chest inside the bunker with the super mutants. The chest has two field medic first aid kits and two doctor bags. And sure enough, we find a pathway that leads down into the trench. This is our entry point. But Oxhorn came under fire, so I brought him back to the APC. Some of the mutants gave chase, and we can run him down. Driving around the edge of this trench, we discover that there are many super mutants hiding within, and they're kind of tricky to kill. Once we see them, and we begin to take a few shots, they invariably kneel down or go prone, making it impossible to spot them. We can't get our APC down into the trench, it's just too big. So if we want to clear the trenches, we have to put a squad down into it, which I didn't want to do. A bunch of these super mutants with light and heavy machine guns waiting to jump us around every corner? No thanks, but Dylan, has a shiny new sniper rifle. I figured if I could get him on top of the trenches, he might be able to shoot down into them from range and at such a great distance that the mutants can't shoot back. Now I knew that this strategy would take a lot of time. It would take patience. I'd have to tweak Dylan's position very carefully to make sure he was out of their range. But I knew that if I stuck with it, I could kill them all without putting the rest of my squad at risk and with Dylan taking little damage. And so before we go down into the trenches to loot, we can grab Dylan, taking him north from the bridge. Already, his insane perception and the huge range of this sniper rifle is paying off. Before he even gets through no man's land, he's already taking pot shots at the mutants in the trenches. I started by taking Dylan down into the trenches to see if these were going to be long enough to keep him at a safe distance. I managed to kill one. But realized that these trenches are just not long enough. The mutants will be able to hit me. However, from this trench, we find a ramp leading to the earthenwork atop the trench. We can now zigzag atop the maze to put ourselves in the correct line of sight to shoot upon the guys we found sneaking down in the labyrinth. For some of these guys, they give us a small window. They'll stand up and we can get one shot off before they lie back down so we'll have to take what shots we can with the hope of whittling them down over time. However, I found one corner here that put me in great line of sight of a bunch of mutants hunkered down in a bunker at their headquarters. They kept trying to shoot me, but they couldn't reach me. But I could reach them. They would stand up to fire. I would kill one, then another would take its place. In this way, I managed to kill a bunch of these guys without ever crossing the maze. There was one section here where I couldn't employ this trick. There are two super mutants lying prone on the other side of a sandbag barricade right next to this bubbling river. Because they're prone, I couldn't reach them if I was too far away, and if I got too close, they could easily finish me off. So some of these guys we are going to leave alone for now. Once we've finished killing all the mutants from atop the eastern trench maze, we can move south to clear out the mutants from this one. And just like on the other side, we do find a few corners here that are close enough to the primary compound that we can shoot into it and get rid of many of their snipers. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Continuing west, we find a man in green armor lying prone beneath one of the bridges leading into the primary compound. He groans and calls out for help, but we're kinda busy. Dylan here was just taking everybody out. We'll have to come back and help this guy with our primary crew. With the trenches clear, I wanted to see how close I could get to the primary compound with Dylan before bringing in the rest of the crew. Who remember can't get here with the APC. We gotta bring him in on foot. So bringing him up to the bridge, we can take a few shots, but they keep ducking or concealing themselves. We can get a couple though. Hugging the edge of this bubbling moat, we eventually find a sandbag barricade with a chest behind it. However, the trunk is locked. We'll have to bring Babs here later. With this lower section explored, the only way deeper in is to climb the earthen ramp right next to the bridge. We find one guy here who keeps on missing us, but as he attacks, he detonates mines on accident. We don't see any mines. At first I thought that I couldn't see them because of my low trap skill on this character. At one point, he ran out of ammo and advanced upon me, but before I could retreat, he detonated another invisible mine, killing Dylan. This portion became really frustrating for me because I tried again a dozen or so times with Dylan, but every time I crept closer, I ended up exploding. Well, clearly the answer is to bring Harold over here to disarm the traps, right? So I put Dylan somewhere safe and brought the guys down into the trenches to loot. I tried to use Mother with one of her thrown explosives to get rid of one of these guys. Got him. But the other guy was too far away, so we'll save him for later. On one of the bodies, we find a Browning M2. This is yet another big gun. A heavy machine gun developed in 1918 and still in use right up until the outbreak of war. Minimum strength, nine. Ammunition, 50 caliber. It weighs 45 freaking pounds. Well, I'm sure 50 caliber ammunition is gonna become more common later on, but at the moment, it's still pretty rare for me. However, we can bring it back to Stoma, who's really the only person with high enough strength to use it in my party, and check out the stats. It does between 40 and 50 damage with a range of 45 and an ammo capacity of 90. Wow. Compare that to the M249 saw, which does between 20 and 30 damage, 20 damage in either direction less than the Browning M2, with a range of 40, five range less than the Browning M2, and an ammo capacity of 30, 60 less than the Browning M2. Well, this Browning M2 is clearly the prize of our collection here from St. Louis. Too bad the ammo is so rare. We'll have to save as much 50 caliber ammunition that we can to make good use of this sucker. Most of the mutants in these trenches have grenades, thrown explosives, and melee weapons on their inventories. We find few other guns. We can finally leave the trenches using an earthen ramp to the south. From here, we can navigate atop the trenches to find an earthen ramp going down to the trenches going west. Here we can loot more of Dylan's dead. And we find another Browning M2, more big guns on some of the others, and at last we can reach the guy lying prone, wearing green armor beneath the bridge. Creeping up to him, we learn that his name is Burke. Brothers, I, I thought I'd been left. They got the general. Bastards took him alive. <coughs> they killed everyone else. Wired me up with some C4. It's a trap. <coughs> you gotta help me. I know I should have warned you earlier, but... Look, I, I don't want to die. Get this freaking rig off me. Do it, Grunt. You guys are expendable. I'm, I'm a senior. Ah, oh, crap. He's rigged. The problem is that I used Mother to talk with him. Talking with him starts a countdown timer. And if we take too long, the C4 detonates. So reloading a save, we can use Harold to talk to him this time, and as soon as the dialogue ends, we can quickly use our trap skill to disarm the C4. <coughs> they got Barnaby. He saw me hiding and he was screaming for me to kill him, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. God, I, I had a cleared shot, but 
I know if I fired, those damn muties may have seen me. Some mutants found me anyway after that. Those bastards were laughing as they tied this rig to me. God. God help me. I should have taken that shot. And it's with immense remorse that Burke here lives to fight another day. Barnaby begged Burke to execute him. The last thing he wanted was to be apprehended. <laughs> oh! And apparently Burke is so overcome with guilt that he commits suicide. After all of that, disarming all of the explosives, he still commits suicide. On his body is some plastique, and lying on the ground at his feet is more plastique. Now, here's another example of where I think the developers originally intended this scene to play out a bit differently. At least, that's what some of the cut dialogue I found in the game files suggests. Instead of that cut scene at the beginning with the super mutant apprehending Barnaki, I think as we got to this portion of the map, we were supposed to witness the final moments of General Barnaki and Brimstone Squad's battle. Pull back! Pull back! Reinforcements will be here soon! Where is my cover fire? I want two snipers back to the rear ASAP! Cover the gunners now! Then, General Decker pops in to tell us to abandon Barnaki. The super mutants have captured General Barnaki, but we cannot afford to lose your squad attempting a foolish rescue. Leave the cowardly Burke to rot in the sun and proceed to your next objective. However, both of these sections were ultimately cut from the mission, leaving Burke to simply tell us what happened instead of showing us. But all of this happened a while ago. Is there any chance we can save Barnaki? With all the bodies down here in the trenches looted, we finally arrive on that bridge leading to the main compound. I sent Babs to go unlock that chest. Inside was an XL70E3 Enfield sniper rifle with 5.56 millimeter ammunition. This was an experimental weapon at the time of the war. Manufactured primarily from high strength polymers, the weapon is almost indestructible. It's light, fast firing, accurate, and can be broken down without the use of any tools. It has a minimum strength requirement of 5, uses 5.56 millimeter ammunition, and only weighs 9 pounds. However, compared to the sniper rifle we already have, it's a bit disappointing. It only does between 14 and 26 damage with a shocking range of 28. Ugh, what even is the point? Though it does have an ammo capacity of 20 compared to the sniper rifle we picked up in this mission, which does between 14 and 36 damage with a range of 50, but a nearly debilitating ammo capacity of only six. So the only upside to this brand new sniper rifle we just found is its huge ammo capacity of 20. Everything else, its range, its damage, and its use of the 5.56 millimeter ammunition, which is more rare than the 7.62 millimeter, makes it an inferior weapon. Despite the description saying that it shoots quickly, it actually costs one AP more to shoot than the sniper rifle. Five instead of four. So a completely worthless weapon. And here's where I got really pissed off. Remember those invisible traps that kept killing Dylan that I thought surely Harold would be able to see? No, nothing. Creeping Harold closer, no traps found, nothing popping up until... Of course. I've tried this several times. And perplexingly, he would trigger traps in areas that he didn't trigger them during previous attempts. Never at any point did he detect a trap. So I put thrown explosives on these guys and tried to detonate the traps from a distance. Annoyingly, by throwing a grenade, I can detect the traps, but the grenades deal no damage. So we can't detect them, we can't disarm them, we can't trigger them with explosives or shoot at them. And this is the only way inside. This leaves us with only one option, grabbing the huge meat shields, healing them up and making sure they have good armor on, we can run them in to trip the explosives. There we go, hopefully that was it. Then with the path clear, we can go grab Dylan and with his superior range, he can try to take out the super mutants inside the base. 
they're scattered all over the place. The trick is finding just the right angle. And sometimes they race at us. We gotta do a bit of kiting, then find some good high ground to take them out. These bunkers clear, we can move Dylan north. We find another bunker, but a good little corner here that gives us a sliver we can shoot through to snag them. But there's another waiting on the other side of this bunker. However, we can shoot through a window. Moving east, we can see our handiwork from earlier. And wow, we absolutely devastated these guys from across the moat. There are none left over here in this bunker. However, we do recall that there was one left by the sandbag barricades down by the eastern side of the moat. But now that we're on the high ground above them, we can find a good spot for Dylan to take him out. It. Every super mutant on the map is dead. Most of them killed by awesome Dylan. We can then bring the fellows inside to loot. And man, they've got a lot of really heavy weapons. We walk away with half a dozen Brownings, half a dozen M60s, half a dozen M249s. Annoyingly, there is one body we simply can't loot. There was this pale super mutant on a sniper platform on the southeast corner of the compound. We shot him from atop the platform, but his body did not fall to the ground, and there's no ladder to get up there. So sadly, I wasn't able to loot this one. But what we don't find is any sign of General Barnaki. He's not here. The super mutants must have captured him, and then as we approached, hightailed it out of there with him. Barnaki is now a super mutant captive. Oh, God. What will they do to a Brotherhood General? Where did they take him? Are we going to mount a rescue mission? We'll have to head back to the bunker to organize our next steps. Like with the last two missions, the death sequence narrated by Ron Perlman is a duplicate. I haven't checked them all, but from here on, I'll only mention the death scene if it happens to be unique to that particular mission. Additionally, we don't find any variations of the mission success audio. There's really only one way to complete the mission, and there appears to be no penalty for clearing out the super mutants from their operations center, despite the fact that General Decker told us to avoid it. With the entire map clear, we can bring the APC back southwest to the extraction point. And upon getting close enough, we gain 5,000 experience and evacuate the survivors of Talon Squad. Then we can bring Dylan down to enter the APC. Welcome back, warrior. The elders have assigned me to be your commanding officer until we have further news of General Barnaki's whereabouts. Your former superior was a fine general, one of the best that I had the honor to serve with. Losing him has been a heavy blow to us all. The Super Mutant Army destroyed a total of six full squads of our brothers. This is a large setback for the Brotherhood since those squads contain some of our finest veteran soldiers. We shall not forget our brothers who fell in the line of duty, nor shall we let these feelings get in the way of our duty. Rest assured that intelligence searches for the General even as we speak. Until we have a lead on where the enemy is keeping him, you will be receiving all mission briefings from me. Go rest, warrior. You deserve it. After you are done recovering and grieving for our comrades, report back for your next mission. You are dismissed. I mean, he was a bit of a racist. Didn't like ghouls or intelligent death claws. But doggone it, he was voiced by the gunny. I hate to see him go. Well, when done, we can head back to Bunker Gamma to lick our wounds. And now we have three vehicles, including the APC. Awesome. We'll heal up, reevaluate our inventory, see if there are any new squad mates to recruit, and learn about our next mission in our next episode. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. 
My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members gain access to derby badges by their names that appear in the comment sections of my videos and access to ox emojis that they can use in the chat of my live streams. Patreon, YouTube, and Twitch subscribers also gain access to a members-only channel on my Discord server. But more than anything, I'm just so grateful you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.